In this episode, I'll explain Game Boy graphics and how to code them. Graphics is a big topic, even for an 8-bit system like the Game Boy. So to keep it simple, I break things down into four big concepts and work through some coding examples for each. I'll also dive into some weird stuff going on deep inside the system, but before all that, let's start with the most important topic in Game Boy graphics tiles. Whether you're showing the bricks in Tetris or the monsters in Link's Awakening, all graphics on the Game Boy are created using tiny images called tiles. These 8x8 pixel bitmaps work like building blocks that can be stacked together to create scrolling backgrounds or drawn individually as moving objects that sit in front or behind those backgrounds. Tiles are just like any other image on a computer. They're stored using a bunch of binary data. Each pixel is represented using one of four numbers, with each number mapping to one of the system's grayscale colors. It's actually possible to make the graphics directly by writing the binary data for each tile in a game's assembly code. But that's kind of tedious, so most folks opt to use specialized editors like YYCHR that can save images to a binary file, which is then included during assembly. Because tiles are used to draw literally everything, a game's ROM is usually packed with a ton of them, but the system can only handle so many at a time. You get 128 for the backgrounds, 128 for the moving objects, and an additional 128 that are shared between the two. Games can change this tile set whenever they want, and the code to do so is pretty simple. Just turn off the display, then use a loop to transfer the data from the ROM to the video memory one byte at a time. This brings up two important points about coding graphics on the Game Boy. First, you shouldn't make changes while the system is drawing. At best, your changes will be ignored, but at worst, you can damage the screen. And second, most graphics code is really simple. All you're usually doing is updating some values in the system's video memory. Take our second major concept, for example. Backgrounds. Backgrounds are stored using a big grid of numbers, with each number mapped to one of the images in the game's tile set. To update a background, all your code has to do is turn off the display, write a bunch of numbers to video memory, then turn the display back on. This is pretty much the same thing you do to update the tiles. Okay, it's slightly more complicated than that. Technically, the Game Boy can hold two backgrounds at a time. Usually one will be used to handle the graphics for a game's level, while the other one defines an optional area on the screen called the window. Just think of the window as an additional background you can layer on top of the level graphics, with most games using it for things like status bars. To configure the background in the window, you write data to special places in memory called registers. Roughly speaking, registers allow the CPU to talk to other subsystems like the audio unit and the pixel processor. Most of the options for choosing how backgrounds are displayed can be set using the LCD control register, and the position for the window can be set in a similar way. The Game Boy has a bunch of registers like this, and each one allows you to change some aspect of the system. For instance, since backgrounds are way bigger than the screen, you can only show a portion of them at a time. Time. The Game Boy lets you control what part to show using two scroll registers, and by slowly changing the values for those registers in between frames, you can implement smooth background scrolling. Additionally, you can modify the colors used to draw the backgrounds using the background palette register. Basically, this works like a map, letting you choose which color to display when rendering the pixels for a given tile. One cool trick you can do with this register is to change its value between frames, allowing you to animate the colors of the background. And this brings me to another important point about coding Game Boy graphics. You don't always have to make big changes to see big effects. Now, when you first load a game or a level, you will need to swap out entire backgrounds and the tile set. But after that, mostly you just need to make small changes in between frames. The Game Boy renders at about 60 frames per second, and the vast majority of the time for each frame is spent drawing to the screen. But right at the end of the frame, the system reserves about a millisecond where it does no drawing, and this is where most games make their updates. This is called the vertical blank, or V blank, and it's the third major concept in Game Boy graphics. The code to figure out if you're in a V blank is pretty simple. All you gotta do is check the LCD Y position register. This tells you which line of the screen is currently being drawn, and if the register reports a value of 144 or greater, then the system's in a V blank. One quick side note, but it's super important, if you do have to turn off the display for like big updates or something, you should always wait for a V blank before doing so. If you turn off the LCD while the system's in the middle of drawing, it can burn a horizontal line of dots into the screen Screen, damaging it permanently. Anyway, one millisecond is a pretty short period of time, so you're kind of limited in what you can do during a V blank. Changing individual values like scroll positions or the palette colors is pretty quick, meaning you can make a lot of these kind of changes in the time given. But big stuff like swapping out entire tile sets or backgrounds, that's not really possible. Though most of the time, you don't need to make sweeping changes like that, and nothing exemplifies this more than the last big concept in Game Boy graphics. 
objects. So the best way to think about an object is as a tile that can move independently from the background. The Game Boy lets you draw up to 40 objects on the screen at a time, and from the system's perspective, each one is represented using four numbers. The first two define the position for the object on the screen, the third tells it what tile to use, and the last number holds a list of options called attributes that change how the tile is displayed. The attributes are pretty simple. They let you choose whether or not to render the object in front or behind the background, whether or not to flip it horizontally or vertically, and finally, which of the two palettes to use when drawing the tile. These palettes, called the object palettes, are distinct from the ones used to define the colors for a background, but they're configured in pretty much the same way. When taken all together, these numbers for each of the objects are stored in a special place called the Object Attribute Memory, or OAM, which is a distinct region from both the system's working and video memory. The Game Boy provides a really fast way to update objects. First, you store all of your data in the system's main memory, then run a few specific instructions to transfer that data to the OAM in 160 microseconds. Yeah, microseconds, meaning this transfer can happen well within the time given for the V-Blank. So usually games will update their entire OAM every single frame. But the exact way that you have to do this is pretty weird. Okay, so for most retro systems that use cartridges, the actual program code for a game is almost always read and executed directly from a game's read-only memory chip. And for the most part, this is also true for the Game Boy. However, when you perform a special OAM data transfer, the code that does it has to be executed from a special place in the system's RAM. Otherwise, it can cause an issue called a bus conflict. So without getting too far into the weeds, the Game Boy works just like any other computer meaning it connects components together using shared data and address buses. These buses are basically just electrical traces in the system's hardware that let the CPU and other components communicate data. Usually, the hardware will turn components on or off based on the addresses being used so that two subsystems don't try to output data on the same bus at the same time. But if something goes wrong and this does happen, it's called a bus conflict, which can cause all sorts of havoc on a running system. So I'm not 100% clear why this happens on the Game Boy, but if the processor tries to read the program code from the game's ROM chip, while the system is also performing that special OAM transfer, bus conflicts can and will occur. So instead, you have to make the CPU read its instructions from a special place in RAM that prevents this from happening. From a practical perspective, this means that games have to set up a special routine to do the transfer from the system's RAM as part of the program's initialization and call that copy of the routine during the vblank to perform the transfer. Thankfully, when it comes to programming this, it's pretty much set and forget but unfortunately, it's not the only weird thing about objects. For example, due to limitations in the graphics hardware, you can only display 10 objects on the same scan line at a given time, and the system will prioritize the ones that are further to the left, displaying them on top of the ones that are further to the right. If two objects have the same X position, then the one that comes first in memory wins. Because of this, it's usually best to put the most important objects, like the ones for the main character, at the top of the list. For all the weirdness, objects are actually pretty cool and make it quick and easy to perform some small updates to the graphics that can really bring a game to life. A great example of this is changing the tiles displayed for a group of objects from frame to frame. This allows games to animate things like Mario jumping or Link swinging his sword. And by combining this with an object's attributes, you can do things like change the direction that they're facing or have them pop behind and then in front of elements in a level. One final thing to know about objects is that they can be configured to be displayed as a single 8x8 tile or two tiles stacked on top of one another. By enabling 8x16 mode via the LCD control register, the system will render two tiles for each object. Basically, it just renders the tile that's assigned for the object and the tile that's next to it in the set, with one side effect of the mode being that you can only reference even numbered tiles. If you want to mess around for the code to handle this or any of the other techniques that I describe in the video, check out the Game Boy Graphics repository on the NES Hacker GitHub. And if you're looking to get started but don't know where to begin, check out this other video I made on setting up a Game Boy dev environment.